At the end of time. Thirteen. O'clock. Hey everybody, what's going on? Hopefully, yeah, okay, the microphone's on because I was going to. Well, right. I always got to check good. now because okay. you never know. Sometimes it yeah. just turns itself off like randomly for whatever reason. <clears throat> Fucking ghosts. They get mad because we talk about them on a haunting Monday. It's all ghost the time. in the machine. <laughs> I guess so. So today we're going to be talking about some CIA stuff. CIA stuff. So you it's know, the dirty shit they were. They, they so were doing. If, so if we end up murdered, yeah, uh, or suicided or something like that, yeah. you'll <laughs> you'll know what happened. They find us fucking with our hung from suicide <laughs> and shot and our throats cut all suicide. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this was actually I didn't know a great deal about this case. Um, one of you guys, actually a couple of you guys recommended it. Um, you know, obviously I had heard about the, um, the whole Contra controversy and like, you know, the CIA knowing about drug running and, uh, you know, drug trafficking and stuff. And I kind of knew about that because I remember when that was going on, like in the 1980s, but I hadn't really heard that much about Gary Webb who was the investigative journalist who he wasn't the first one to break the story because the story actually did break in the eighties, but nobody really picked up on it. He was just kind of the one that, you know, picked up the torch like a decade later. And then there was like a huge controversy, but um, he's kind of like an interesting figure. Like I said, he sadly passed away now, but I was watching, uh, if you look around on YouTube, there's not a fuck ton of stuff about him, but there is um, some stuff from like the hearings back from that time, like when they investigated the, the allegations that he made. And I also found a, uh, somebody recorded him talking like uh, at a bookstore in, at, in uh, Berkeley, like right after, like in 1998, I think it was, like right after his book came out. And um, so that was, like, really cool. It was, like, almost an hour long. So I, like, listened to that on my lunch hour today. So it was kind of cool to, like, listen to him talk about his own book and, like, talk about the allegations and talk about, like, the shit show that ensued, like, after they published it because it was kind of, like, uh, pretty shitty, like, what happened to him. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Murder Hornet said, I remember the Oliver North trial as a kid. Yeah, I do, too. Like, I think I was probably – I wasn't young, young, but I was kind of, like, too young to really know, like, all the – intricacies of what was going on and i have to say that this is i mean i tried to do like a lot of research about this case but it's like it's very complicated so i'm going to try and kind of keep it fairly simple um i have like three different sets of notes <laughs> to like because i was yeah. just kind of like well i had this set and i was like well i don't know that didn't really cover like everything i wanted to cover and then like i have so i kind of just printed them all out and i just have them at different places so if i'm like if i'm ferreting around like looking for stuff like looking for people's names and shit like that because i gonna might be a forget good show. them it's gonna be a good show well this was like yeah like i said this was really interesting and you know it's I kind of feel like the whole the whole uh, Contra drug war thing, that's kind of like a whole like massive, huge topic. Um, I do want to kind of stick more with Gary Webb, but we can t kind of talk about and like what happened to him and stuff. But, um, you know, obviously we have to give context. So we have to talk about it. And I know that a lot of our listeners are not from the United States, so they might and maybe weren't alive back in the 1980s. So um, so maybe they don't remember like all of these allegations that came out like about the CIA. And as I said, it's kind of sad that Gary Webb got sort of, I don't know if I'd necessarily go so far as to say he was hounded out of the profession because he did still, you know, he did still work as an investigative journalist, but for sure um, he kind of, his career was kind of ruined. You know what I mean? That's like what they did. by, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, obviously, whether it was suicide or murder, um, you know, uh, he he was for sure really um, depressed and really upset about the shit that happened to him. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was murder, but the way he – or suicide, but the way he died was a little bit weird. So All you big, powerful countries have intelligence agencies. They're, they're, they're dirty, all right? And they also have, like, counterintelligence people involved in that. So if somebody's investigating them, they're going to say, well, that's a spy, or they don't care if it's a spy or not. Okay, just anybody investigating what they do, they're going to fucking send counterintelligence agents after them, which is 
contractors, you know, that do shit like prank call you fucking 24-7. They can find your phone number no matter how many times you change it. They were doing that back in the 80s. Stalking people by phone, um, hounding them at their house, just terrifying them, you know. And, they, in, in the per- person would never see them, you know. Like, they pick up the phone and it sounds like, you know, rabbits screaming and stuff or children screaming, that kind of stuff. And they don't know... In one case that I remember just off the top of my head, I think it was Israeli counterintelligence doing it to a guy. Uh, Because he was investigating something Israel was doing. And he was in the United States. Could have been, it could have been CIA though. They probably, maybe, maybe they were involved with, you know, because they were involved with intelligence agencies in, uh, in Israel. They worked together. So it could be that they just covering their friends back. The CIA was. You say CIA, that's kind of a vague term. There's a lot of compartments in it, and they hire people to do stuff. Yeah, and that's the thing, and I kind of feel like, and I was thinking about this while I was reading about the case. It's like, you know, it's very easy to say something like, oh, the CIA did this and that and the other thing, but it's like the CIA is a massive organization, and it's like, dude, I work in an office with like 19 other people. It's like, I don't know what the person in the next office is yeah. doing like much less somebody like way across yeah. the fucking country or like you know in another country or something like that so you can't just like lay shit on the of like the whole thing because like you said it's very compartmentalized yeah and the guys that actually do stuff in the real world they don't a lot of times they're doing stuff and they don't know that they're doing it for the cia you know the cia owns companies and you know front companies that do stuff and, uh, you know, they may not be a paramilitary company. They might be like a faction inside the telephone company, you know, might, might be Sprint or something. And they got people inside Sprint working and they can just, you know, trace any kind of calls anywhere, you know, or they're looking for certain people and they're working in. And then other ones are just fake companies that they can just open up for a few years and then close it and it would vanish. But while it was open, it was doing something, doing something shady. And the guys that were in it, maybe most of them probably didn't know what they were doing or who they were working for. You know, you're just kind of like innocent people. Yeah, you that's know. that's kind of the thing. I do feel like that's why, and I think I've said this before, but that's why I don't have a problem believing in like small conspiracy theories where it's just like a handful of people like, you know, maneuvered and did some shit. But the bigger the conspiracy gets, the less I believe in it. Because there's just too many moving parts. And the thing about it is that, like you said, it could be, just, you know, just for a random example, that it's like somebody gets recruited into something, like going to work for a company or something, and they're doing all this stuff, and it's like a front for the CIA, and they don't fucking know that. Yeah, that's a conspiracy. Yeah, that's well, big. yeah, yeah. No, I'm not saying that, but yeah. I'm just saying that it's like I, I kind of feel like conspiracies are work better when they're more like localized, like that. Uh, you know, I what I'm worked, f- I worked for a company that did shit, trained people from all over the world, police and stuff, and you're not really sure who the students are. the The client was State Department, Department of State. All right, but everybody working in there is a civilian. You know, not really sure what you're doing. You're just doing what you're told. You're just running ranges and doing courses and classrooms. They got guys cleaning classrooms and cops and soldiers and stuff from all over the world are coming in there to do these post-blast investigation courses. And this is a private company. It's not the government. All right. So, yeah, that's a conspiracy. Hell yeah. And that, and that, that particular company's gone. I've looked for it online. It's just gone. And it was around for about seven years. So don't tell me that a conspiracy can't be big. No, it can be very fucking No, big. that's not what I said. Okay. That's, that's not what, what I was said. thinking you were saying. No. No, it can be very big. Like the Manhattan Project was fucking huge. And most of the people yeah. involved in it didn't know what it was. But that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah. I, I'm saying that when you get into these things where people talk about this conspiracy theories where like all of these people have to know about all this kind no, of stuff. No, they don't know. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the case. That's, that's what I mean when I okay. say that like the bigger it gets, no. like the less it's, no. you know what I mean? Well, you can have four or five companies working together and only the guys that are directing the company know. Nobody else knows. Nobody else knows what, what they're really doing. They're, you, because it's all only the guys that have a need-to-know basis, or the, you know, 
and they're taking orders from I don't want to say government people because that those guys are kind of like mid-level functionaries the guys who really run the shit are basically oligarchs captains of industry you know the robber barons that you heard about you know in the early 1900s that built the United States they won they didn't lose they won they just they're just invisible now they own all this and control it it all works for them Camp Guy said, I've always heard this about the CIA and cocaine. Yeah, and the thing about it is that even though they swore up and down back then that they knew absolutely nothing about it, uh, they did actually kind of come out later and go, yeah, we did kind of know about it. I'm not going to go so far as, because I think one of the main criticisms of Gary Webb's uh, series that he wrote, which was called Dark Alliance, we'll get into that in a little bit, but was that I think that people thought that he was implying. I don't think he said this outright. And like when I watched him do a talk like at Berkeley, he actually said outright that he didn't think this was the case. He's like, I don't think it's the case that the CIA, because like, you know, a lot of people like, um, particularly back then in the 80s and 90s, like in South Central and stuff, they thought that the CIA was purposely flooding the streets of South Central Los Angeles with crack in order to fuck over black people. Um, I don't necessarily, I can see why they would believe that. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think what probably happened was that the CIA was kind of like involved with, I think they more kind of turned a blind eye to it or were just kind of like, we're just going to let that guy do that more than like doing it on, you know what I mean? Here's another way to look at it. If you're a government agency that has a mission... And you're trying to keep this mission secret. The last thing you want is your budget to be exposed, you know, before Congress or anything else. You can tell what an, what an, what what a unit is doing by how it's spending money. Drug money's cash and it's untraceable. That's a, that's a black budget right there. So if you're an intelligent intelligence agency that has connections and ways and means and ways to make money through the sales of drugs you not you directly but you're hiring contractors to do it right. for you okay this is the big deal this is this is the thing they don't actually do it it's three or four steps down yeah so they okay. can have plausible there's deniability. all kinds of plausible deniability now the money can flow to them and the, the drug dealers and everything and and, the, and and even the smugglers can make their cut but at the top it's flowing up into the into an intelligence agency, and uh, that's invisible money that can be used to do some kind of mission, or to buy a swim pool, or to or to get a mansion, or to hire sex operatives. It's whatever, whatever. They just need money that's invisible, and that sounds preposterous. Oh, that could never happen here. Yeah, right. You're like you're a fucking child. Okay, intelligence agents agents agencies are bad. They recruit people that are bad. You need people that are morally flexible. People that can lie, cheat, steal, kill, and fuck other people to get a job done. There's sex operatives. There's all kinds of shit happening in there. Some of them are underage. The, the recruitment might be from prisons. It might be from uh, uh, orphanages. It, it, and you can say, well, that, that could never... That's been going on here for a long time. I actually saw things come out for Congress where they were taking women out of or this is back in the 80s and they didn't they, they kind of pled no contest they were taking women out of orphanages and torturing them to get them to have multiple personality disorder to turn them into damn sex operatives and i think they were doing it in the 70s uh, but it kind of or at least the, the the girls that were made the complaints were from the 70s uh when that's but they were making the complaint in the 80s but i think they were talking about it happening in the 70s um, okay, well, one that we'll admit to, or the United States will admit to, is that North Korea has an extensive drug manufacturing, smuggling, and sales operation. They use their their intelligence agencies to do it. Their intelligence agencies have a bunch of fishing boats, is what they use. They, uh, they, they have spy equipment on them, but they use them to smuggle drugs. And they hand these drugs over to dealers at sea, and then it Money's exchanged, and then the product's taken away. But it's North Korea doing a lot of it. Even, even, they even counterfeit money. You know, they'll counterfeit U.S. bills and stuff. So yeah, this is happening. This happens. This is a reality. This is not something that just made up. 
It's a part of warfare. Been going on for a long time. I mean, I think fucking even during the Napoleonic Wars, what was it? Napoleon had all that counterfeit Russian money printed up and dumped it out, fucking in, inside of Russia or something, to try to collapse their economy. I, I have to. This, that's just off the top of my head. I'd have to go back. It's been going on forever. Murder Hornet said, my ex-Navy SEAL friend that later worked for the government, uh, OGA, which are like subcontractors for the CIA, etc., told me personally they smuggled drugs even when he was in. Yeah, like I said, I don't, um, I don't doubt it, to be honest with you. Um, I don't know, like, I, I don't know how feasible it would be to have, like, a CIA agent, like, actually selling drugs. They would get, like you said, they would go a couple layers back and, like, get yeah. other people to do it, which is what they essentially ended up doing. They have their own air force called Evergreen, and they were shipping stuff around. Go look for the Evergreen <laughs> fucking terminal inside any, any airport, and you'll eventually find it if it's a big airport, and that's them. That's CIA. Um, that's their Air Force. But, uh, yeah. Um, what, what, what did he say? Oh, what they do is, is they, they need invisible money so they can do things like buy weapons and hire terrorists. Yeah, for various things yeah. that, that they don't want people to know about. They don't about. want you to know about. <laughs> and it can't be traced back to them. So drug right. money's perfect. It's untraceable and it's cash. And I'm kind of feeling like this is probably what was yeah. going on in this situation because, you know... Yep. That's a, that's essentially what they were doing. They were just like getting some money in there. All right, so before we start the show, I want to say that every six months or so, I will go back through all the shows and read the comments that have accrued. Uh, there'll be people in there trying to get our attention and shit. Hey, you know, you haven't answered me. We don't really get notifications regularly anymore on, on YouTube. Well, I do, but sometimes I don't have time to go through all of we don't the have, right. comments. Best way to get in con, you know, the best way to get in contact with us is through like, well, you can get in contact with me through Instagram or Facebook, or uh, what else? What's to be another way? There's a way to, to, to direct message uh, the show. Probably Instagram, huh? Well, I'm more likely to see the Facebook comments, Facebook comments, and okay. um, or Facebook messages, and maybe Instagram, and yeah. also if you go to the website like the 13 o'clock wordpress the website where i um yeah. you know post all the shows there is a button there where, that you can write a message and that comes yeah. directly to my email and yeah. i'll for sure see that because yeah. you know but i check my email every day it kind of sucks because we got super fans in there you know trying to communicate with us and you know they'll post a comment and i'll see like a new comment on a video of fucking eight months old you know what i mean and had i you know we, we really just don't we're not reading those comments. Very rarely. We'll see them very late. Like I said, I try so. to keep up with them. I can't keep up with them the way I used to. I right. feel like I used to keep up with them like pretty well, but now there's like so many and it's just kind of right. like I don't have enough and I don't have a lot of time like I used to. It's so. important contact us directly. Yeah. If not, you it's going to be a long time before you get a reply. <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, I try. I do try yeah. to like keep up with stuff, but sometimes I don't see them, or sometimes I don't busy. have time yeah. um, to answer them like right away. Yeah. And sometimes I'll be like, "Oh, maybe I'll answer them this weekend," and then like I never get around. We to got it. super fans in there. We got fucking uh, people complaining, super enemies, uh, people wanting to know. If, nah, I ain't gonna say it. <laughs> just fucking crazy shit. What do uh, they want to know? Uh, a couple weeks ago, somebody wanted to know if you were really female. That was one. I was like, "What the fuck is this bitch talking about?" Uh, uh, just, That's nice. Yeah, he does something. Is that a man? You know, fucking. That, I was. I was like, what the fuck? Go back and go look at some videos. They have some cleavage, and you will definitely see that that's a woman. Okay. Um, what else did they fucking say? Uh, uh, one dude was saying that I was corrupting the youth. Uh, well, yeah, that that's was, our goal. I'm corrupting the youth. <laughs> I'm like, for well, shit, man. Good, go I'm, us. I'm like fucking Socrates now. I'm like fucking Socrates. They're gonna make me drink hemlock for corrupting the youth. Uh, uh, just it's crazy shit. They got crazy people out there. But other, other, other listeners jumped on him and says, "Man, what, what the fuck's up?" He said, he, "We said we were ageist too." So he must be an old, old guy. We're old too. Yeah, I don't know. That's <laughs> fucking funny. Sometimes I, it's really weird. Like people sometimes have, people make comments that it's like, I, "Well, I don't even know yeah. like what it is that they're referring to or what they got offended by." You yeah. know what I mean? I think, well, sometimes people just want to be mad about something, yeah. so it's just like they want to comment on some video, and it's like they don't understand, like, nuance, they don't understand, yeah. 
humor. They don't understand like a lot of things. So you know what I mean. So I don't really pay that much attention. Yeah. <laughs> to Another st- one was that they, stupid comments. They've been like listening that. to the show for a long time. I used to love it, but now the show's boring because you guys just get drunk and fucking and bullshit. That's another one. They're like, well, that's what the show is, kind of. Well, and honestly, I feel yeah. like in the last in the last <laughs> few months, yeah. um, you know, since I've been working and stuff, I feel like we've been better about yeah. staying on topic. Yeah, and not getting as fucking trash. I mean, lar- well, yeah, because now I got to get up in the yeah. morning, so it's like I try not to get like too fucked up. Yeah, you're both corrupting the youth, and we're yeah. enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, I was corrupting the youth, right? Yeah, it's funny, and that's funny. Like sometimes too, like the comments are like, "Well, are they?" trying to make a joke and they just don't know how or are they really serious i don't know i don't know <laughs> jenny you a man lol yeah, yeah surprise yeah. uh yeah not really yeah. but um <laughs> that was the the video when you first showed it with the side of your head shaved i figured On that's that probably like yeah. as soon as you said that i was yeah. like that's yeah. probably what it was yeah because no girl is no ever girl's gonna shave do their head yeah right other than all the ones yeah. that have mm. so you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> Does that make Tom gay, says Murder Hornet? I could have sex with a man and still be straight. <laughs> because if you actually do, like, blood chemistry tests, compared to me, you just look at the blood fucking and the testosterone level, compared to me, most most men are women anyway. They're just, like, ugly women. Ugly women with a lot of hair on them. I don't usually stoop down that low. <laughs> I, can have, I can have sex with fuck Dude, I can have sex with you, and I'd still be straight. It's just because you're a woman compared to me, man. It only gets dangerous when you try to... It only becomes gay if I'm having sex with, like, Jason Statham or fucking The Rock. <laughs> then, yeah, that's gay. That's gay. <laughs> oh, Tom just went off on a little fantasy land Yeah, there. that's gay. <laughs> <laughs> James Knapp said, you've been a lot better about staying on topic since the new job. Yeah. I think it's because, um, you know, like I said, one, I can't drink as much on the show because I have to get up at five in the morning. Um, and two, I, you know, I just got home from work, like, an hour ago, and it's like, I kind of want to i don't want to rush the show along but i want to make sure that we get it done like at a reasonable hour so i still have time to like relax for a little while before i have to go to bed you know what i mean so there's that so i have actually been trying to like kind of keep it keep it sort of on the thing but i know that people do like the the you know little diversions i mean i like them too that's one of the things i look forward to doing because i don't I don't like to get too, like, wrapped up in it. Oh, my God, we can't talk about other things. Like, I don't want to get too anal retentive about it. But on the other hand, I don't want to be here for, like, five hours either. (laughs) So there's that. So um, anything else you'd like to – any more things you would like to mention? No, I'm going to cut you loose. Go ahead. You're going to cut me loose? I'm going to cut you loose. Go ahead. Gee, thanks. It's like the horse, you know? Let it cut it loose. And it, so now I know. look like a horse and a man. Yeah, you're the horse and a man. No, I'm saying when you release a horse, <laughs> when you release a horse in, into the fucking round pen or out the pasture, and it does its own thing. Go ahead and do your thing. Okay. Well, All thank right. you. Now, right. uh, yeah, just feel free to throw in any time because, like I said, this is a this is a massive, massive uh, topic. So I try to do like a lot of research, but I'm kind of a little bit scattered at the moment. So let's do a little bit of background in case. As I said, you weren't around back then, or you're not from the U.S., or something like that. So, back in the late 1970s, in Nicaragua, you had a, essentially like a military dictatorship. It was kind of like run by a family, and the head of it was uh, Anastasio Somoza. Now, in 1978, 1979, there was a, uh, you know, revolution uprising, uh, the Sandinista Revolution. And uh, they took out the, you know, dictatorship or whatever. Now, the, the dictatorship had been actually backed by uh, the U.S., so they were not happy about them getting taken out. And they didn't really have any legal way to get them out of there because of the way it happened. So they're like, we got to think of something else to do. So in the early 1980s, uh, Ronald Reagan, who was president then, he, on the down low, um, put aside about $20 million uh, to set up a paramilitary force uh, that would be trained by the U.S. of 500 Nicaraguans. Uh, they would be known as the FDN. We know them better as the Contras. Contras, yeah. And some of my squad leaders in the Army were ex-Contras. After all this shit went down, a lot because they lost, basically. They were... 
some of them were wanted for a lot of shit. They were uh, evacuated into the United States, and uh, basically most of them inducted into the United States Army. They were good dudes, but man, they were. We had one guy. I think his name was um, Sergeant Sandoval. I think is what his name was. His wife was a was a contra intelligence officer who had basically tortured about 50 people and I think killed a lot of them. And uh, she was wanted. She's like, <laughs> so they had to hide her and put her on a military base, the U.S. military base for protection. Yeah. If I can remember when that fucking, when that shit came out about her. But no, we had Contras as squad leaders in the early 90s. They were good, man. Real good dudes. Funny. Funny as shit. They were ruthless though. Yeah, I guess so. We trained them over there at a place called the School of Americas. That's yeah. They were coming out of yeah, that was that was like the first training hub for them, and then they, from there they would become contra NCOs and shit. They were just a kind of a semi-professional resistance fighter. We were always talking about oh man, they're, they're fucking funded terrorism and shit. That we've been doing that for a long time. We just called them fucking rebels or freedom fighters or guerrillas, you know, gehadas. Yeah, know? you can't call them terrorists. Yeah, you, you couldn't call them terrorists. You have to think of like a. You nice gotta think of another name, name for them. <laughs> fucking terrorists, man. Yeah, pretty much. And this shit about putting dictatorships in Central and South America, we were doing that going all the way back to the fucking Banana Republic Wars of the fucking early 1900s. The United States did a lot of damage to Central and South America. That might be an interesting show to do, too. Like, I saw a couple documentaries about that a long time ago. And it was all because of these fucking New York fucking investors up around Wall Street wanting cheaper prices for bananas. So they got all these banana farms and stuff and fruit farms in Central America and they want cheaper prices, but their their governments are want fair prices. So we'd overthrow that government and put one that was friendly to us in there. Dictatorship usually. All right. Yeah. And we could get cheaper prices. So yeah, we did a lot of damage. America was, you know, all the propaganda side and I served the US Army and everything and the American people are great. The country's great. Its government has fucking always been rotten. Always. Don't fucking believe the hype. It's been a force of evil in the world for a long time. It's just that we recast it as something else. We're helping. No, we're not. No. Didn't help any of that. Any of those places. <laughs> Look at Iraq. Look at Afghanistan. We didn't help them. Uh, we did not. No. <laughs> just made money doing it. Little projects and shit. Danny Rowling said the Beast of Jersey, a.k.a. Edward Paisnell, serial rapist, would make a great true crime show. I actually... Um, Wrote, I put that in the poll a couple times, but it hasn't won so far. But I do actually want to do, uh, you know, I do actually want to do a show about that. But I, I do have that written down, like, on my list, you know what I mean? But we'd overthrow those countries down in there. This has been going a long time. Uh, so we could have a dictatorship there to keep it safe from communism. Because the Soviets were trying to overthrow those governments, too, and put communist governments in there. We, we couldn't have that happen because they put missiles over there. And the missiles would be closer. So we're like, oh, well... Fuck Central America. We're gonna we're gonna give them dictatorships. Yeah, pretty ruthless. Fucking ruthless. Yeah, I mean they don't really give a rat's ass uh-huh. about the actual people nope. that have to live there. Nope. You know? They just didn't want Russian missiles there. It's all it was. Yeah, essentially. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of the case in uh, Nicaragua as well. Yep. So so yeah. So back in the eighties, um, basically they're like, all right, so we need to train this little army that we got here that's backed by U.S. money and CIA and stuff like that. Uh, so we need to get, give them, obviously, uh, you know, supplies. We need weapons and stuff like that. So we need uh, a way to fund this without anybody being the wiser, you know. So uh, essentially what they decided to do, hey, I have a good idea. Let's get into the drug trade. So um, essentially what so what ended up happening was that, um, and, and this is, you know, where Gary Webb would come in, like, later on in the 90s. This is still in the 80s before he, like, reported on it. But essentially what he was arguing happened was that the U.S. was basically, like, they were funding, not really funding, but they were allowing, um, you know, Nicaraguans to flood American streets, uh, you know, starting in Los Angeles, but also in Miami, too, like, to a smaller extent, with cheap crack cocaine and all of the money they were making obviously the dealers and stuff like that would get their cut too but then like all of the other money was being funneled back to the contras 
So that's basically what Webb was arguing, and that's pretty much, like I said, I feel like they denied it, denied it, denied it for like a really long time, but then later on they're like, yeah, we did kind of know about that shit. You know what I mean? Essentially. But they, they didn't say that they did it, but they said we knew it was going on and kind of more like turned a blind eye kind of thing. Now, interestingly, even though Gary Webb didn't write his series until 1996, uh, and it, like I said, it was called Dark Alliance, and he wrote a book about it later, too, there had actually been two guys from the Associated Press, and they reported on this story way the fuck back in 1985. Uh, their names were Robert Perry and Brian Barger, or Barger, I'm not really sure how you pronounce his last name, so I'm sorry about that. And they wrote a, a piece about it as well in 1985. And they found through their investigations that uh, Contra groups had indeed engaged in cocaine trafficking uh, to finance their war against the Nicaraguan, the Sandinista government. And when they printed this, I feel like one of the reasons that that story in 1985 didn't get all as much traction as it got like later on was because, um, you know, the, the Reagan administration at the time, uh, they started doing like little uh, behind the scenes kind of operations to basically um, kind of besmirch their reputations. Like uh, they discredited all the reporting and it's like they, you know, they had all these things going on that said like, oh, that shit wasn't true and tried to like ruin their reputations and stuff like that, which was kind of like a little bit of a, uh, you know, a little bellwether of what was going to happen to poor Gary Webb, like, later on. Um, however, uh, in spite of all of the kind of shady, underhanded dealings that they were trying to do, like, to, to discredit these two reporters, the first ones that broke the story back in 1985, um, some people in the government, in the American government, were mad about it. And, um, you know, so they wanted to kind of get to the bottom of it. So in um, the late 1980s, there was actually a Senate subcommittee, uh, which was chaired by uh, John Kerry, who was a senator at the time. And he, him and his uh, subcommittee, like, looked into the charges. 1989, they put out this massive report, like, over a thousand pages. And basically, and it was about, mostly about, like, the cocaine trafficking, like, charges and stuff like that. But it was also, like, other covert operations that had been going on in Latin America and the Caribbean. And uh, according to that report, 1989, this came out, uh, the Contras were definitely linked to running guns and drugs and that the U.S. government knew about it and was essentially allowing it to happen and maybe trained them allegedly <laughs> and allegedly also was like protecting yeah. drug dealers and things like we that. We told them to do that, trained them how to do it. Right, right, right. Come on. And uh, the subcommittee report, I have a little quote from it right here. On the basis of this evidence, it is clear that individuals who provided support for the Contras were involved in drug trafficking. The supply network of the Contras was used by drug trafficking organizations, and elements of the Contras themselves knowingly received financial and material assistance from drug traffickers. In each case, one or another agency of the U.S. government had information regarding the involvement either while it was occurring or immediately thereafter. So that came out in a report in 1989, and that was like several years before uh, Gary Webb, you know, printed his thing, like, picked up the story and like printed his thing. So, uh, so yeah. Now, so this subcommittee report comes out, over a thousand pages. You'd think this would be like a massive story. Not so much. Uh, didn't really get a lot of attention from the papers. Um, and it kind of seems like, I kind of feel like maybe... Um, they were kind of like going, maybe the CIA was kind of going behind the scenes and be like, hey, but you kind of like not, like not pay attention to that or something like that. Because I do kind of feel like a lot of, you think that a lot of newspapers want to like pick up that story, but they really didn't. Like not, it, there wasn't really like a huge media outcry about it until later on, like when Gary Webb did his thing. Now the thing about it, so here's what happened with Gary Webb. Now Gary Webb, he actually started out as a journalist, I think he, he wrote for like the Cleveland Plain Dealer and stuff like that. And he was actually uh, quite well, well respected. He wrote a lot of stories about, um, you know, a lot of what they would call muckraking, uh, where he would just, uh, you know, he did one particular story about a guy that was like, you know, with mob ties. And he did all that kind of stuff, like trying to, you know, bring down the powerful type of thing. 
And he actually won, um, him and his team, like, won a Pulitzer Prize a couple years uh, before all of this shit happened. Now, as it occurred in the 90s, he was working for the San Jose Mercury News, which is like a smaller newspaper, like, in Northern California. And he had been doing a story about, um... I was going to say it was about, what the fuck was the story about? Oh, it was about asset forfeiture. Because prior to 1993, I guess there had been a law in California and elsewhere that if you were accused of drug dealing... They took all your shit. They took all your shit. Like, all you needed was an accusation. And he's like, that is some bullshit right there. So he wrote, like, a big story about it. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, and he (laughs) essentially said that. So he wrote, like, a big story about it. Three weeks after his story came out, they overturned that law. And they said, now they can take your shit, but only after you've been convicted, which I was like, okay, that's fine. Fair enough. But it's like... At least there's a due process. Right. But it's like, yeah, just like somebody's... Because you could hate your neighbor and just be like, hey, my neighbor's dealing crack. And they're like, shoop, and they take all your shit. Because you can't prove that you didn't buy that stuff with drug money. You know what I mean? That was what they were... It's like, it's a stupid law. I mean, obviously. But yeah. So he had been working on a story about that. And it so happened that he was approached by this woman who was like the girlfriend of like a drug dealer. And she was kind of the one that clued him in to, she's like, you know, um, all of this, you know, this whole big crack epidemic, which, you know, was kind of a big story, like in the 80s and 90s with, uh, you know, particularly South Central Los Los Angeles. Like I said, it kind of started there and it kind of started a little bit Miami. And then I was watching a thing where Gary Webb was talking where it kind of started in two places and then kind of like met in the middle, like in the Midwest. But it was just this massive, massive thing because it was, you know, cocaine had been, I feel like in the early to mid 80s or maybe in the 70s as well, it was kind of like more expensive. So it was kind of more like a, maybe like a middle class and up kind of drug. You had to have money for cocaine. You had to kind of have money for it. Um, And then crack came along, which, you know, was good for the dealers because you could make a lot of it. Yeah. And it was, you got like a really high return. Yeah. Uh, and it was highly addictive, so people would keep coming back, like, to get more, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was just, like, 20 bucks, you know, for a hit, and then, like, they'd come back again and get Yeah, a small amount like, of more cocaine more. made a much bigger amount of crack. Right, so you could get, like, get a lot of your money back. It, yeah. Because I was watching an interview with a guy I'm going to talk about in a minute who was, like, a big drug dealer in L.A., uh, Freeway Rick Ross. And um, he said that... No relation. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, well, he's not white, so, okay. you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you could still be related, I'm just saying. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's a Yeah, very, I got black cousins, but they don't have my last name. That's true. Yeah. That's, that's a very common last name. Yeah. But he was saying that when he first started selling, there's kind of, like, some controversy of whether he was the person that, like, sort of introduced crack to South Central. Um, I don't know how large his involvement was his involvement was big for sure because he was like one of the main big drug dealers particularly of cocaine in in that era um but you know would it have happened anyway without him who knows i I don't really know but he was saying that prior to him starting to sell crack um the main drug with pcp actually they're like that was kind of the big thing and marijuana because that was illegal then but uh, I was like, really? I don't remember there being a big PCP thing. But yeah, he, but he was saying, yeah, that that, that was the main all thing. Frying their baby alive and putting yeah, the baby in right. the microwave. It's all PCP stories. Uh, that's right. Going crazy and ripping your own arms off, trying to pick up the car, uh, running through the streets. <laughs> yeah, you heard that shit? I've heard those stories. Dude was yeah. so strong, he started throwing cars until it ripped. he ripped his own arms off. That but I shit. feel like, I, yeah. other than like a few kind of, you know, random urban legends like yeah, that, yeah. I kind of feel like you didn't hear about PCP the same way that you heard about crack or cocaine or heroin or even. PCP wasn't as alluring, not as many people did it. That, yeah. But he was just saying that when he first started selling cocaine, everyone kind of, like, made fun of him because they're just like, what? Nobody's doing coke. Everybody's doing PCP now. Like, why don't you give it to cool kids? But, um, you know, I guess he he had the last laugh because soon he was making, like, $3 million a day, like, selling fucking crack on the streets of South Central. So, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So, Gary Webb got very interested in this story that this woman had brought to him because she's like, you know, she's like, I have actual proof that, you know, my boyfriend, the drug dealer, um, had ties to 
the CIA who had ties to the Contras. And we are, you know, we have documentation that, you know, it's all linked, that that's where the money's going. It's going to fund the Contras in Nicaragua. And Gary Webb is like, well, that's very interesting. Um, I'd be very interested to see that, uh, that. So she brought him this big stack of paperwork and he went to work on it. I mean, he worked on this for pretty much a year. Um, just doing all this research and shit like that. Now, when this series came out, as I said, at the time he was working for the San Jose Mercury News, which, you know, is a smaller paper. And they published in 1996 uh, his series, which is called Dark Alliance, which actually initially was just like three articles, like three long articles that were published like over three days, like in August of 1996. And... What what it was was that it kind of focused on three guys in particular. One of these being the aforementioned uh, Freeway Rick Ross or Ricky Ross or whatever, who was a big one of the main drug dealers in L.A. and like I said, kind of one of the people that helped to introduce uh, crack to uh, South Central, which honestly really kind of devastated um, the black community. There was, like, a whole generation. It wasn't just the fact that, like, people were on crack, but also this was during the whole war, war on drugs era when, like, the prison sentences and shit like that were getting, like, really, really bad. Yeah, so, ridiculous. <laughs> right, yeah. So so they were, like, Gary Webb was even saying, he's like, you know, there's pretty practically a whole generation of, like, young black men that were just, like, just for possession and stuff like that were put in prison for 30 years and shit like that. It was just, like, fucking ridiculous. So... You know, and, and a lot of people in the black community were, like, really, really mad that, like, all of this fucking stuff had happened. Like, and all of these drugs. Three strikes, you're out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, and, and, That's right. And the main proponent of that was Joe Biden. Did you know that? He was big behind that. And now, and they got rid of that, though. Good, th- good thing. It was recently yeah. that they got rid of that. That was fucking ridiculous. Yeah, like I said, that just seems like a dumb... It's just ripe for abuse. I kind of yeah. feel like I remember that starting during the Clinton administration... And me being like, that seems like a dumb idea because that is just, like I said, it's just ripe for abuse. So you get arrested for one little bullshit thing and then get arrested for another little bullshit thing. And then you get arrested for a third bullshit thing and suddenly you're in prison for life. That's dumb. The whole war on drugs was just a way of make money out of, of, make something out of nothing. You could take a worthless white powder and make it worth a shit ton of money. And on on the back of that, you could, you could ramp it up as some kind of a threat to society and make shit ton of contract money uh, making police forces and prisons. And then the same guys who's making money off the prisons and the police forces can double dip and get involved in the drug trade. They were doing that. Bringing in the drugs on one end. Not all of them, but they were, some guys were making money on, on that who were politicians. They were taking the shit too, Okay. And then on the other end, they're making money selling contracts to build prisons and fucking expand police forces to make a damn police state on the back of this. People getting high. Let them get high. Even the DEA, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration was like, this is kind of draconian. This is going to cause a huge problem. You, you really should make all this stuff misdemeanors and just c- try to control it and uh, maybe do some drug treatment programs and hand some of it out for free. You know, uh, but... Uh, the DEA at the time didn't want to crack down on it at all. But hell no, man. The fucking House and the Senate and everything, they fucking, they were going, cha-ching! No, we're going to make this shit. We're going to do this drug war. We'll make a shit ton of money. That's exactly what they did. They, they, yeah, like I be- said, man, America's a great place. I love the country. love the people, the, the culture. You got 50 different states that joined up in this union. And uh, But Washington, D.C. is a bunch of fucking rats, man. <laughs> <laughs> fucking criminals. They don't give a shit about the people. They just want to make money. Well, yeah, I mean, doing. anytime that much power and yeah. money is involved. You cannot centralize this much power and have good people sitting on those thrones. All right, it's going to be fucking the worst kind of person you can imagine. That's what's that's what's going to make it there. Uh, just super fucking immoral, fucking power hungry uh, uh, liars. That's what That's what you're going to have there. And fucking, they're all sociopaths. They're not even psychopaths. They're sociopaths. Well, like I said, you kind of have to be to get up to a certain yeah. level like that. They'll just say anything. They don't believe anything they say. So, um, so yeah. So this, um, 
series was published. And the first article, which I think came out on the Sunday, uh, you know, and then it, the other one was Monday and Tuesday. The first sentence of it was, for the better part of a decade, a San Francisco Bay Area drug ring. Wait a minute. I had this written down here. Sold tons of cocaine to the Crips and Bloods street gangs of Los Angeles and funneled millions in drug profits to a Latin American guerrilla army run by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. That was the first sentence, which, you know. Also, um, and this was would cause some controversy later on, the artwork for the article, I'm not sure about the print version, but the web version, and we'll get into that because this was one of the first... Um, real big like expose muckraking journalism things that went really big on the internet because this was only 1996 remember mm -hmm. so this was kind of like one of the first things to kind of go viral i guess maybe um you know and like a small newspaper kind of like taking over like the national stage like that so um but it had like artwork of the cia logo with like a silhouette of like a dude smoking a crap crack pipe over it so the CIA were a little bit upset <laughs> by that artwork. I think they were more upset by the artwork than anything else. But yeah. Um, so so the series was arguing, um, or was kind of implying that the, um, the cartels in Colombia, uh, you know, that there had been a pipeline opened uh, from there to, you know, first to the black neighborhoods of Los Angeles, which kind of like caused the whole crack explosion or at least like kind of helped push it along like to as bad as it got now as i mentioned the uh the series focused on mainly on three kind of key players you had freeway rick ross who was like this big um la drug dealer then you had this other guy who was a nicaraguan uh drug dealer named oscar danilo blandon and another N Nicaraguan dude named Norwin Menezes. Menezes? I'm not really sure how you pronounce his last name. Menzies? No, it's M E N E S E S. Menezes. Menezes. Menezes, I think is. Yeah, now that I say it like that, I'm yeah, like, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's right. Um, so, so we're kind of focusing on these three guys. And what, and also he got a little bit into like later on how. Particularly Blandon, who was like this big deal, like a uh, drug dealer, like in Nicaragua, how he was essentially allowed to operate pretty much with impunity, um, even though like probably he should have been caught and prosecuted. So that was kind of why Gary Webb was arguing that the CIA was kind of like just letting him do his thing because they you know they he he never got like arrested he never got prosecuted for anything for like 6 7 years like while he was doing all this stuff even though you know he wasn't making a big secret about it now uh basically what ended up happening was that uh Blandon he, he kind of like went into his background and he started smuggling cocaine he was a contra supporter and he actually started smuggling cocaine to give them money that's what he started doing and then you also had uh, Manessas, who was also a Contra supporter and also a smuggler. And he was the one that taught Blandon how to smuggle and gave him the coke that they cooked into crack. Now, Freeway Rick Ross, who, like I said previously, had been kind of selling, uh, you know, he'd been selling PCP and weed and stuff. And then he started selling cocaine. But then, like, when this whole crack thing uh, started out and he kind of saw a market for that, um, he started buying crack from Blandon. And because he essentially had the only hookup for that, and because he was such a big drug dealer, he pretty much had the LA market like under lock as far as crack was concerned. Um, so you either bought from Freeway Rick Ross to sell your crack in LA, or you didn't get any you know what i mean because he was kind of the only dude that had the hookup so those were the first two articles and then the third one was kind of more about uh the repercussions like what was happening in particularly in south central los angeles like among the black community like what the cultural effects of like the crack epidemic were uh so there was that whole thing too and then there also was kind of some stuff about uh the differences between how 
uh, how Blandon was treated and how Rick Ross was treated, like, after their arrest. He was kind of, like, trying to do, like, a racial profiling thing, which he actually wrote some articles about that later on, about, like, um, racial profiling and, like, traffic stops and stuff. Like, after he got, uh, after he was <laughs> booted off the paper and was writing about, like, other things. So he writes this three series thing and they and they actually wrote more articles about it like you know over the next three months like kind of expanding on it a little bit and as i mentioned um this was the first i mean stuff had been published on the internet before like i said this was 1996 which was like the early days of the internet but this was kind of the first one that was like a big deal and everybody was like really impressed because not only did it have all the articles there like on you know and everyone around the world could read them but it also had like all these links to interviews that he had done like with all the players and like all the you know the backup like the records that he had like to back up his assertions and things like that so anybody in the world could like go in there and look at it so it was like a big so it was like a big thing and as i said the the artwork that was on the uh the website with the cia logo with the guy with the crack pipe um yeah the cia were particularly mad about that they did end up taking it down later on because it was like too controversial and they said that makes it look like we're selling the crack and they're like well you know but uh so there was that now interestingly so the shit comes out and immediately there is a massive kind of i mean people were just like freaking out and were like mind blown or like you know, I feel like nowadays it would come out and everybody would be like, yawn. But but I guess, like, in the 90s, it was a big fucking deal. Like, everybody was, like, freaking out about it. Now, what ended up happening, though, interestingly, is that you would think that, um, that after a story of this magnitude went, you know, the 1996 equivalent of viral, I guess... You would think that, like, other major newspapers would want to pick it up, uh, pick up the story, like, expand upon it, do their own investigations, and, like, get in on the shit. Which they kind of did, but not really in a way that you'd expect. Basically, what they did was they came in and they started trying to, like, poke holes in the story. Like, it, like he had overstated it, you know what I mean? So they were kind of trying to downplay it a little bit. What? One of our uh, best supporters and friend of the show, Louis Hernandez, has just showed up. Well, hey there. Hey, what's up, Louis? <laughs> Camp guy said it sounds like a James Bond movie. Yeah, well, Ian Fleming knew exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, this kind of yeah. shit happens all the time. Yeah. It's not like he wasn't like making that shit Yeah, up, Ian you know? Fleming just didn't pull that out of his ass. He was part of OSS, which is a kind of like a precursor to the CIA during World War II. And uh, cousin to um, the dude who played Dracula. What's his name? Um... Christopher Lee. Christopher Lee. That's right. C cousin to Christopher Lee. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's a small world. Yeah. Yeah, what's up, Louie? What's going on? <laughs> Thanks for all the movies, man. I think we got it. We, we got all his movies reviewed, I think. Uh, I think we did, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you forgot one, man, drop it in the comment section. Because you sent us so many over the years. I think I got all of them. But there was a time during the move when, a, when some videos came. I don't end... I think we lost the order of whether or not we actually reviewed them. But I think we got them all. That he yeah, said. sometimes. Like I said, I try to keep track of shit, but yeah. I kind of wish I had a secretary, but I can't afford to hire one. I'm going to get you a girlfriend. That would keep track of shit yeah. for me. I'm going to get you a girlfriend. But the thing about it, though, is that <laughs> even if I had that, I wouldn't trust them to do it yeah, right. Yeah, probably do it right, yeah. Because you know what I mean? I'm kind of a control yeah. freak a little bit. Not, I don't know if I'd call myself a control freak, but... I'm always just like, well, I want things done a particular way, and I don't have time to like explain to people how to do it. So I'm just, I'm just like, yeah. fuck it, I'll just do it. It's easier than having to explain to somebody else how to do it. So yeah, um, so the San Jose Mercury News said Breakfast Club. Did he send us the bre bre Breakfast Club? Oh yeah, 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 that's right. We, okay, we'll do Breakfast Club. Wait, we didn't review that. I guess we didn't. Oh shit, man. I guess we didn't. Oh man, we need to do that. I thought we did. I thought we did too. I have to look. We we'll go back there. and look. I mean. Maybe we saw it and then never reviewed it. And then forgot it. about and forgot it. To like, like forgot to do the review. That's could, happened could be. before. Yeah, that may have happened. And I love that movie. Yeah, to be honest, I probably don't even have to watch it again because I've yeah. seen it so many times. Like it's like I've almost like memorized it. James said hire me as hire Tom as a secretary. You have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, man. I could I, He wouldn't be good at that. I'm just not, I'm not, and that, no offense. I'm just saying no. you, you would not be you're not no. good at that kind of thing. No, my He's not a good organizational no. person. I'm the organizational person. I can't really organize data that real well real well I'm not really good at that 
And I can't can organize equipment and physical stuff. I can up to a point, but then after a while, even I still like stuff starts slipping through the cracks. Mm. <laughs> Cause I told him, I was like, you don't understand. Like inside my brain, yeah. it's like having a hundred like tabs open on Google at one time, yeah. like all the time. It's always like that. Um, <laughs> Uh, Danny Rowling said, Jenny needs to review the film Valley Girl. Uh, yeah, I actually had been wanting to do Valley Girl for a really long time. Tom's never seen it. Uh, Nicolas no, Cage was in it when he was really young. It. And um, it's got a good soundtrack, too. It's got modern English and psychedelic furs. And How long have we been doing it? Um, what, an hour. Okay, hour. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Super chats are active, people. And if you're listening to this recorded, we also have uh, Super Thanks. You can give us that. And uh, do we want to do commercials now or do you want to do them later? Uh, I guess we could do them now. We're just going to do a commercial now, because we might be almost halfway through it anyway. Yeah, we probably are. Okay. All right, so we're going to do some commercials, yep. and then we'll be back in a minute. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers under the lead that dewed holes of their room, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall.
All right, we're back. Look at it's just the top of Tom's top head. My, yeah, I'm tying my shoe. <laughs> right. yeah. I was gonna wait, but then I was like, why? I ain't got time for them waiting on me. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't want to wait on. You. Yeah. So uh, we so, got yeah. shit to do. We got shit to do. We yeah. always have shit to do. But yeah. So uh, let's see. Where was I? Okay. So the the articles get published, and like I said, the the main three were over three days, like, in August of 1996. And then, like, over the next three months, like, they kept uh, publishing, like, follow-ups and stuff like that. Um, now, and other papers didn't really, uh, they weren't real quick to pick up on the story. However, uh, the black community in uh, Los Angeles were pissed at the allegations, the implied allegations, because, like I said, Gary Webb, when I saw an interview with him, um, or, you know, his talk that he gave at Berkeley... He basically stated outright, you know, I don't think that the CIA were like, actually, like, directly, like, selling drugs into, you know, South Central in order to purposely, like, destabilize the black community or something like that. Like I said, I can see why they might believe that, but he's like, I don't really believe that's what's going on. That was just, like, a bad, like, a sad it was the side, the effect. side effect of, like, what they were trying to do. Which was just, like, making money, and they found, like, a market, and that's just what happened. And the, the rest of it was just, like, sad fallout. But, um, but so, yeah, so the black community was, like, particularly mad, and they kind of, like, took the story and ran with it. And they had, like, all kind of, like, fucking town meetings where they were, like, shouting at the senators and everything like that. Now, uh, two California senators, Barbara Boxer and uh, Diane Feinstein, uh, they kind of like we need to get to the fucking bottom of this so they actually like went to the ci then cia director his name was john deutsch and uh janet reno who was then the attorney general and said uh you guys need to investigate this shit because uh you know this this is not a good look uh maxine waters who was also the representative for the 35th district in california of which uh you know south central los angeles is a part um she actually became one of gary webb's um you know biggest supporters because she was just like uh completely outraged by the um articles and the fact that the cia would be doing that kind of shit and uh you know so there and there's actually she was um at one of the hearings there's i think it's on youtube somewhere it's like two and a half hours long and i watched like little parts of it but yeah she's like super pissed so um so yeah so there were all these calls for investigation into it so about a month after the series first was published uh, there were three federal investigations that were beginning to be undertaken. Now, uh, interestingly, the investigation into the allegations against the CIA that they knew what was going on uh, was conducted by, guess who? The CIA itself. Yeah. The CIA Inspector General. Yeah, we shall investigate. Who at itself. the time. <laughs> we didn't do it. Uh, the name uh, was named Frederick Hitz. Yeah. Uh, they were also doing an investigation into law enforcement, just the fact that law enforcement was just kind of, like, letting stuff slide, like, not investigating, like, all of these key players. Uh, so they went into that, like, the Justice Department um, Inspector General uh, investigated that. And then there was another investigation into the CIA by the House Intelligence Committee. So three investigation investigations. Uh, and also, because Gary Webb kept writing, like, follow-up articles... Uh, they also did a fourth investigation into the shit. So, like, they, so people did take notice, you know what I mean? It's not like nothing happened. Now, um, the thing about it, one of the things that they were, because remember I said that they were talking about law enforcement and how, like, a lot of them kind of turned a blind eye to shit, and they brought up, like, a bunch of examples where particular drug dealers were, like, doing shit, like, out in the open, and, like, law enforcement were like, la, 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 don't see anything kind of thing, you know what I mean? Um, one of the examples that they gave was, like, this raid that had happened in 1986 on uh, Blandon, who was the big Nicaraguan guy. Um, the, L the L.A. Sheriff's Department, which seemed to be the only law enforcement, uh, you know, agency that gave a shit about any of these allegations or were actually trying to do something about it. But they actually um, did a raid on this dude's, uh, I don't know if it was his house or his just his operation in general. And allegedly, and I'm saying allegedly, so don't sue me, allegedly they had, they found evidence that tied Blandon directly to the CIA, but this, um, but this evidence was, uh, you know, kind of covered up, you know what I mean? So, uh, so yeah. And, uh, also the, so the LA Sheriff's Department started looking into shit on their own like i said they seem to be the, like the only major law enforcement agency that was like yeah we need to do something about this everyone else was just like yeah we're gonna pretend it's not happening 
Now, as I said, interestingly, after these claims, a lot of the other major newspapers in the country didn't pick up the story and expand upon it, as you would think, maybe. Um, they said, well, we're going to do our own investigation into it. But a lot of them got kind of like hostile against Gary Webb in particular and were saying that the article was overstated or he had made a bunch of allegations that he couldn't substantiate that you know what i mean that weren't backed up now while it is true that some of and i am gonna say like i have read portions of it i will say that he did use some kind of like overheated language a little bit like they do you know what i mean to get people to read it and he did make some implications that maybe if you wanted to read it a certain way like maybe he's saying a particular thing so because i think that a lot of people took it that he was saying that the cia was like directly like selling drugs into like you know bringing drugs into la and i don't think he ever said that directly now you could read it in a way that it did sound like he was implying that and i think people were mad that he didn't have any like direct evidence of it you know what i mean so i think that they thought that he was like overstating things which okay fair enough maybe he was but all these other papers really fucking piled on him i think that maybe this is weird but like to a smaller extent you have to think this is like the 1990s still and this explosive expose was published in not a dinky paper but like you know not a major newspaper it was san jose mercury news you know what i mean like in northern california and I think that a lot of the major newspapers, like particularly the LA Times, because they really like raked him over the coals, I think they were mad that he had scooped them. So they were gonna like, you know, shoot holes in his credibility because I think they were upset that he was getting all the attention. I think that was maybe one of the things that was going on because there is kind of like bitchy, like jealousy and stuff like that in newspaper, in journalism, you know what I mean? She so I worked for a newspaper. For I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. She knows about the industry. She, we're not talking about our asses. We have actually have worked in some of these fields that we talk about. Yeah, I'm not you saying that that was the entire great. thing. I just think yeah. that that might have been a factor, yeah. particularly with the LA Times, because the LA Times is like, we're like the major California newspaper, and it's yeah. like, here's this dinky-ass Northern California, and they have this big thing. And yeah. I think they were mad, too, because it was like one of the first big web uh, you know, articles and everybody was talking about it and stuff like that. And I think they were upset that they hadn't done it. They're bitchy, it. you know. That's bitchy, what I mean. Bitchy. So I think there was a little bit of bitch. I, I don't think that's the only thing that was going on, but I think that that was for sure a factor. They probably got orders to fucking try to fucking put the kibosh on that shit. I kind of feel like maybe. Because the CIA has its figures in the media bigger than shit. And also in Hollywood, that all happened during World War II when they were still the OSS. When the CIA formed after World War II, one of their fucking biggest arms of operation was... Hollywood, Hollywood, and fucking television, because uh, that's your propaganda arm. American movies are propaganda. People don't realize it. Pro it's not just corporations involved in that shit doing product placement. There's uh, intelligence agencies and political groups in there putting fucking messages in there. Because well, the, the entire world sees those movies, or they used to, and they don't watch that shit now. But fucking back in the day, um, in the uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know what I mean? Fucking a good American movie was seen all around the fucking globe. So you could show off how much better you were than the Soviet Empire. There's all kinds of stuff that they were doing. Well, there was a thing that came out like many years later. Like, because I don't know if you guys know, um, but there was a movie that came out in 2014 called Kill the Messenger, which was about Gary Webb. It was basically like, an, and I've heard it's really good. I haven't seen it. Um, I was actually going to watch it before the show, but I didn't have time. You had to like rent it. It was three ninety nine, and I was going to watch it like on my lunch hour. And I was like, shit, I don't have time to like watch it. Cause I was watching some other documentaries. So I didn't have time to watch it, but I've heard it's good. Jeremy Renner is in it. He plays, uh, Gary Webb. And, uh, it's based on like a biography of Gary Webb that came out like a couple years after he died. But, um, but yeah, it came out like later on that, the CIA were actually kind of like, you know, certain factions within the CIA were kind of scrambling when Gary Webb's series came out because they said whether they're like, you know, whether the allegations are true or not, they're like, this is a really bad public relations disaster, essentially. So we have to mitigate this somehow. So I think maybe they did kind of go to 
certain like you know larger newspapers and stuff like that and kind of suggest to them it's like you know he said all this stuff he just like pulled this out of his ass he, he can't back up these claims so you know maybe he encouraged like maybe they encouraged like some of the other newspapers to like write something that was like super critical of him and indeed a lot of them did uh the first article that came out criticizing the dark alliance series uh actually showed up in october in the washington post and uh two reporters wrote that and they basically said that um you know while some of the a few of the allegations might have been true they're like um that the evidence that he put forth in the article didn't uh support the claims that he was making and they also said that well the whole rise of crack could not be attributed to just one person or one thing it was kind of like happened in a lot of different places at once so he was simplifying it and you know various other things like about his relationship with freeway rick ross like in the whole thing with the attorney because i kind of feel like freeway rick ross at the time like the drug dealer he was um trying to he was on trial so he was kind of trying to maybe lessen his culpability a little bit and i think they kind of looked into claims so like his attorney was saying it's like oh the cia made me do it kind of thing you know what i mean very simple sort of thing um we had a request Tom and Jenny, you guys should look into the murder of DEA agent Enrique Kiki Camarena in 1985 in Mexico by the Guadalajara cartel who kidnapped him and killed him allegedly with the CIA. Ooh, that's another good... Yeah, okay. Let me write that down because yeah. I have like so many things written down over here. And uh, Okay, so we're going to look up Enrique Camarena. I will put that in the next poll probably well yeah i could put it in this poll because this poll hasn't gone up for this week yet so i can put it in there and see how that i've seen uh, mexican cartel members videos of them just out in the street picking things up you know they got the vehicles all around them they're armed it's a fucking cartel member definitely a cartel member look at him caucasian the way he's cat carrying himself and it's just his skill set what he's doing with his hands how he handles the weapon i'm going that's u.s army infantry ex-infantry so it's it just you know, and I had I had a friend who's doing time. Uh, we were in the army together, and he ran a Central and South American Death Squad, basically. Okay, <laughs> and uh, his name is Van Vacius, Timothy Mc Van Vacius. You can look it up. He's doing time right now, but he'll be back out. He um, killed a. He either attempted to kill a DEA agent or, or or killed the DEA agent. I don't know if he was the dirty DEA agent or what or. But his clientele were cartels and people in the Central American governments, many of them. They were going to make a mo movie about him. Just Google Timothy Van Vacius, and I can show you pictures of me and him together in my yearbook in Korea. Good buddy of mine. He stayed in the service for a long time, got out of the high-ranking NCO, and was doing that, running death squads for many countries, many governments. And um, it had to be CIA. <laughs> if you get compromised, you go to jail. All right, they don't save you because if they save you, then that's a then you know, yeah. Right. Then they know. But no, he's CIA. So and uh, been, they were trying. One of the things. Oh, for, reason why I mentioned him is because Van Vakius and his men. They were international mercenaries. Some of them were European. They had Russians. They had Americans. One of their big gigs was to give military training to like multiple cartels down there that the CIA probably from behind the scenes helped control. But uh, being a trainer is big business, training cartel members. Okay, go ahead. So the next thing that came out, uh, one reporter named Tim Golden wrote two articles for the New York Times in which... Um, he basically said the same thing that like the evidence in the uh series didn't back up like the assertions uh brought up the stuff with freeway rick ross and his attorney and uh basically said that he didn't think like according to his sources he didn't think like the drug dealers that gary webb talked about in his article were as important as he had made them seem uh you know just in terms of how much money they actually gave to the Contras or how involved they were in introducing crack or whatever. They were basically saying, again, that, like, all of the 
allegations were overstated. Now, the LA Times went overboard. And like I said, I think that there was maybe a little bit of professional jealousy here because they were mad that they had been scooped on such a big story. Because they got 17 reporters, a team of 17 reporters to basically, I don't know if they basically said, hey, discredit him, but they're like, well, we need to like go over this story with a fine tooth comb and like find some shit that's like not legit. You know what I mean? So they did a whole series, 17 fucking reporters. And one of the reporters later on said they actually called it the Get Gary Webb team. <laughs> that's what they called it, which is crazy. So there was four reporters that wrote the three articles that eventually ended up uh, coming out. And uh, essentially they were making the same argument that it's like, oh, the crack ep epidemic is a lot more um, complicated than he's making it seem like it came from like a lot of different sources at once, not just kind of one place as he was implying, um, you know, and sort of that, just that kind of thing. And uh, again, claimed that they didn't give that these particular, that Blandon and um, Minet... How did, how did I say it before? Menesis? Menesis? Yeah. Something like that. Because I, I said it yeah. right, and then, yeah. like, now I can't remember how to say it right Menesis. anymore. I don't know why. Yeah, in a but, Latin language, you say Menesis. That's what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah. Uh, Louis said, yeah, the LA Times was jealous because Webb got his story first. Yeah, yeah. I kind of feel like that played a part. They're for bitches. Sure. For you sure. Know, they're bitches. Yeah. Well, it's just like any other yeah. professional... I mean, you want to be the one that gets the big... I mean, you know, you want the accolades, you want the Pulitzer, you want the whatever. If somebody else, like, scoops you on the shit, you're going to be mad. Those old those old news agencies today live in a perpetual state of, uh, of, of cuckdom. They're cucked out constantly because in the modern era, everybody got a cell phone. So they're all breaking... People on the streets are breaking all the news. They don't do shit anymore now. Well, and I kind of feel like this particular story yeah. when Dark Alliance came out, because like I said, it was kind of the first one that went major like on the internet right. because, you know, it was pretty, internet was yeah. in its pretty early days back then. And I think that they were, maybe they were mad about that too, that now like a small newspaper could break this huge story that was like yeah. getting like federal investigations and shit like that. And it bypassed like the larger newspapers. So I think they were a little bit upset well, about that. Well, if you that. look at the larger news newspapers even today and it was like this back then they're all about numbers making money okay uh they didn't ha they didn't do a whole lot of investigative journalism because that takes too long it's not you got to invest a lot of time and a lot of money and then you're gonna you know six months later a year later then you got one story to put in your paper and a lot of times the story isn't sensational so if you if you look at what they're doing now is they mostly just do stories on the stories that they read in other newspapers. It's like a chain. Well, of, like I said, it's easier. Yeah, it's like easier you don't do have it. to. Right. Well, I mean, the thing about the San Jose Mercury news, even though I will say that in the end, they did kind of end up like fucking like selling Gary Webb out a little bit. But for a while, they actually encouraged him. I mean, they they poached him from another paper because he was a really good... He won a Pulitzer Prize, like I said. I think he won it for... I think it was the Cleveland Plain Dealer, if I'm not mistaken. But they, you know, offered him a job to come out to California and work there because they were looking for an investigative journalist. And on this particular story, even after the shit started to hit the fan and everyone started to criticize the story and saying it was sh and shooting it full of holes, they did allow him to do further. They even they flew him to Nicaragua like a couple of times and like let him do like follow up stories and shit like that. But in the end, like you said, investigative journalism is an expensive proposition like for a newspaper yeah. you have to pay for your reporters to go places and you they know be gone for months. and they could be gone for months and yeah. like i said you know that then there's no guarantee that the story is going to be any good or anyone's going to yeah. read it or anything like that so it's much easier to just kind of like scour the web and it's like yeah. re Ooh, rewrite yeah. some shit yeah that, that's what they're doing that somebody you know that's that doesn't take any yeah and um, now that they have ai like they have article spinners that'll yeah. kind of that it just do it for you. Yeah. And you just kind of tweak it a little bit. Yeah. Foreign critics of the U.S. news media have noticed that now it's just an incestuous relationship against, like, fucking between, like, four or five major U.S. New news uh, papers, you know, like Washington Post, New York Times, all that crap, L.A. Times. And all they do is m mirror each other, you know? 
I mean, they're this, just trying to sell material. They, they, they're yeah. not serious anymore. I mean, there's still investigative journalism going on, but it's generally it's smaller. Yeah. It's generally smaller. It's on like, the internet. More independent. <laughs> yeah, independent internet shit. type stuff that, yeah. uh, that actually care about the shit, that like want to get the information News out. News print. There. Television, news media, I can't believe that they still got old people watching fucking television, man. You watch television, it'll depress the shit out of you. You're transported back to fucking 1994 and shit. But I can't believe people still consume that media because it's just so backwards, you know? Um, backwards and boring. The internet's so much better, man. I'm so glad for, for, for a free and open internet. Uh, the information's better and it comes faster. And it, and it all comes with videos because people are just fucking witnessing it firsthand with cell phones and shit. I mean, it's harder to keep up with stuff now, for sure, because there's so much more of it, but I would rather it be like that. Well, yeah, you know, it's the way it always was, independent news. It was always like that before, it's just you didn't know about it. You didn't know about it. (laughs) You didn't know about all the shit going on. And then, um, well, what you do is, is you go, uh, YouTube's a good source, Rumble's pretty good, you're gonna find people that curate, that go through all this shit. You know, every... and will uh, kind of put a little report out, you know, of any subject you want. You know, they're watching their own particular subject. So it's specialized news. You know, like just talking about Disney. They got g- dudes that have a channel just talking about the news that's leaking inside the Disney Corporation between Kathleen Kennedy and Bob, you know, and all the, you know, and they want to know what the Mandalorian's going to be like and why are they fuck. Guess what, people? They're going to, s- Disney's going to sell Star Wars. That's the newest leak. Disney says that Star Wars is fucked up. They can't fix it. They're going to sell it. They're going to keep Marvel, though. And I believe it. The sources are very good. We'll see if that happens. Well, Marvel is like fucking printing money, man. Yeah, they're going to keep Marvel because they can fix Marvel. It's had some problems, but they don't think they can fix Star Wars. They're going to sell it. But yeah, so the LA Times, as I said, printed, you know, they did their own thing. 17 fucking reporters researching this shit, which, like I said, even some of the reporters later were like, that seems a little like overkill, you know what I'm saying? At least one of the reporters that worked on the series that was trying to essentially, like, discredit Gary Webb's story, or at least say that it was exaggerated, uh, his name was Jesse Katz, he actually came out later on uh, and sort of apologized. He felt kind of bad about it. Like, in 2013, he came out. He said, uh, and this is a quote from him, he said, as an LA Times reporter, we saw this series in the San Jose Mercury News and kind of wondered how legit it was and kind of put it under a microscope. And we did it in a way that most of us who were involved in, in it, I think, would look back on that and say it was overkill. We had this huge team of people in the LA Times. Yeah, this was a massive paper back then. And kind of piled onto one lone muckraker up in Northern California. And he also said, we didn't really do anything to advance his work or illuminate much to the story, and it was really kind of a tawdry exercise, and it ruined that reporter's career. Because I kind of feel like the story... So he had put out this story, and I feel like the responsible thing to have done, yes, like, investigate the claims. I mean, they're explosive claims, as I said. So yes, you should investigate that, because it's entirely possible that... Some of them are not true or they're exaggerated or something like that. So that's a completely legitimate exercise. But I do kind of feel like as that went on and as more papers started to do that, I mean, and some papers did defend him, like the guy from the Baltimore Sun and everything like that did come out and say, it looks like good investigative journalism to me. Yeah, maybe he used like some little overheated language or something, but everybody does that. It's not that big a deal. But I kind of feel like because that happened to him, I kind of feel like it became the story Gary Webb wrote this thing that was exaggerated and nobody really got interested in the actual story anymore or like actually getting to the bottom of the actual story because it all kind of came about became about the guy and like the claims that he was making instead of people actually investigating the actual claims or trying to like expand upon the claims you know what I'm saying so if there was somebody behind that like if somebody like the in the CIA like you know PR office or whatever if they were behind that they did a good job because they very successfully like got the focus away from the allegations that the CIA had you know done all this wrongdoing and actually got the focus back on Gary Webb like the reporter that you know broke the story so you know, they, they did a good job there, have to say. Now, I will say, okay, so the San Jose Mercury News, I mean, they must have known that the story was going to be controversial, for sure. 
But I think they were surprised at the reaction of the rest of the media, or not all of the rest of the media, but, uh, you know, the larger newspapers. I think they were surprised by it. Now, at that time, the executive editor of the Mercury News was named Jerome Sepos, um, and he actually wrote to the Washington Post, and he stuck up for Gary Webb, like saying, you know, he defended it. The Washington Post, however, would not print his defense, would not print his letter. Um, and also, just to be on the safe side, he actually got another reporter at the San Jose Mercury News, the same newspaper, to kind of like write a a critique of Gary Webb's series, just so, so it would look like it was more balanced, I guess. Um, and also, like I said, they took down the, the artwork that the CIA had cried about, like on the, on the website. I don't think it was in the print article, but it was for sure on the website, which more people saw because that was like a million hits a day, which back then was like a huge amount. So they printed, uh, this article by, you know, another guy at the same paper critiquing it. So it would look more balanced and shit like that. Um, you know, and so then when the LA times thing came out, um, the you know the editor he again like wrote to the la times like defending the original series and you know did interviews like all over the place where he's like you know gary webb he's a you know he's a good investigative journalist if he said this he had all this stuff like to back up his everything um but you know what i mean but the thing about it was that he got so much blowback that he's like okay well i guess now we have to kind of like acknowledge that this is a really controversial thing and like maybe we should go back over it because maybe Gary Webb did make some mistakes. Maybe he did over-exaggerate some claims. Maybe he doesn't have some stuff to, like, back up his everything. So um, he basically came out and he's like, I still defend the series. I still think it was well-researched, but we are going to, like, look into it to make sure that he wasn't making any allegations that he can't back up. So, um, so yeah. And so it was, like, this big back and forth for, like, a really long time. And as I said, there were some newspapers that defended uh, Gary Webb, like I said, particularly the Baltimore Sun. And I should say, too, that the Society of Professional Journalists actually gave Gary Webb the Journalist of the Year award uh, that year without too much controversy. I think one guy didn't want to do it, but they were like, yeah, shut up. And they gave it to him anyway. Now, so basically after that, like the, the newspaper that had originally published Gary Webb's series... They did a several month um, internal review, like a critique of the story, and uh, by a couple different people that worked at the paper. And their conclusion was that they basically found um, some problems with some parts of the story. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, they did actually give Gary Webb money to go back to Nicaragua to get more stuff like get more evidence to like back up his story like you know um so gary webb was there for a while he actually wrote four more articles like while he was in nicaragua and he came back and filed them but uh the editors uh they eventually decided not to print them because they didn't think that they um substantiated his claims to any great degree like any more than the original one had so he did all that for nothing so, like I said, they did send him to Nicaragua, pay him to send him to Nicaragua, but they didn't print the stuff that he wrote. And uh, they also did not print the other guy's uh, critique of the shit either. Uh, but they did let Gary Webb keep working on the story. They sent him back to Nicaragua again, uh, you know, a couple months later. And uh, so that whole thing was done. And then they published another uh, column in 1997, in May of 1997. And so all of this stuff happened, but then the editor kind of came out and said, well, we kind of think the original series and all the subsequent stuff, um, there were all these areas where maybe it could have been better. Um, they were like, there was some conflicting evidence um, that was not presented in the article that maybe would have uh, contradicted some of the article's assertions. They're like, that was one thing. Um, they said that the amount of money involved and how much the drug dealers were, uh, contributing to the Contras, uh, was presented as a fact and not as an estimate. That was also another thing that they, uh, said was not right. 
Um, they also said that the article, the original art series of articles oversimplified the, um, the start, the origin of the crack epidemic, making it seem as though, you know, this whole thing that, you know, Rick Ross and all them, like, and Blandon, they were the ones that opened up the pipeline, essentially, when they were like, well, it kind of happened in a bunch of places at once. And um, also, they said that there was some language in there that was, quote unquote, imprecise, that would give people impressions that maybe uh, were not able to be substantiated. Um, you know, and Gary Webb came out and just said, you know, fuck you guys. Uh, you know, he stood by his shit. And, uh, you know, but the editor was kind of like, um, he did actually, the editor did take responsibility. He's like, I'm the one that printed the shit. So, you know, that's kind of my thing. Now, Gary Webb was mad as hell about this, um, as, as you might imagine. And uh, he basically accused his editors and everything like that of, uh, quote unquote, selling him out. He thought they sold him out. And, um, you know, but the, the other editors of the paper were like, yeah, but, you know, there were all there was all this other evidence that contradicted what you were saying. And you didn't tell us about that. And it's just like all this other kind of stuff, because I read like some other people, like some other people that had worked with Gary Webb. And most of them were kind of like, yeah, he was like a fucking great investigative journalist. You know, he was amazing. Um, but a couple people did say, well, he had a tendency to like uh, over exaggerate claims or something like that. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just saying little, a couple people did say that. So what they did, like just to kind of settle this whole brouhaha, they didn't fire him from the San Jose Mercury News. But basically what they said, they're like, well, you can't work in the Sacramento Bureau anymore, which is where he lived in Sacramento. So that's the place where he was working. They're like, you can either move to the main offices in San Jose uh, and have like an editor pretty much like barking down your snorkel all the time. Barking down your snorkel. Or you can go to, is it Cupertino? You're from know. California. I've you never, never heard, heard of that place? Never okay. heard of the place. Um, Probably. Or you can go there and just do kind of like spot reporting, like whatever story comes up and you cover it. Both of these jobs, it should be noted, were very long commutes from where he lived. He lived in Sacramento. I think that where he ended up going, I think he said it was 140 miles, like, hmm. one way. And I was like, holy shit. Talk about, and I talk about, bitch, about my commute, which is 54 miles. It takes about an hour. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So he was not happy about either of these decisions, but he did take the one in uh, Cupertino. But he only worked there for a little while. He's like, the commute was super long. Like I said, I think it was 140 miles. Um, and they were just giving him a bunch of bullshit stories to cover. So eventually he fucking quit. Now, uh, so yeah. So after that, the federal investigation results kind of came out. Not surprisingly, a lot of the ones that kind of came out were basically all they found was that, yeah, there were tentative links between... It, it essentially it boiled down to the CIA. They think that certain elements of the CIA. Now, some of the investigations, like the CIA investigation, like nobody knew anything. We don't we don't know anything. But some of the other investigations came out and said, well, they do think that the CIA was at least turning a blind eye or protecting certain people. Like they for sure knew what was going on, like with the drug dealers, yeah, they knew. vis a vis, you know, and, and they were actively like not allowing people to be persecuted like uh, prosecuted because they wanted the shit to continue well they knew where the money was coming from right 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 so that was kind of like the thing that they came out with even though like i said the cia report was kind of like yeah here's we, the you know, thing this is not doing. unusual for the for, for intelligence agencies no it's not unusual they'll deal with prostitution drugs they'll deal with anything human trafficking yeah if it's money and power or a way to get a hold of something that they want, they'll do it. <clears throat> no, there's no oversight. It's run like a their own little fiefdom. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So, but like I said, it kind of felt like a lot of the reports that came out, even though they did, it did kind of vindicate a few of his claims, namely that the CIA did kind of know what was going on. Um, but a lot of the implications that he was making in the series, you know, that the CIA actively knew what was happening and like they were helping funnel like millions of dollars, like back to the Contras and all this other kind of stuff. Most of the federal investigation said, yeah, we didn't find any evidence of that. I don't know if that's true. Probably not. 
that they didn't find any evidence of it. They're like, yeah, we found evidence, but we threw it away or ate it or something. Now, so Gary Webb, you know, he was working at this other, you know, at, in Cupertino or whatever. And uh, he decided that he was going to take the Dark Alliance series, the article series, and turn it into a book. And so he did that. And so he expanded the articles out. He got more evidence. And he also kind of incorporated into the book um, all of the criticisms that he had received and kind of like tried to address those. And also just the whole like fucking shit show surrounding it, like the controversy and for controversy and like what had happened to him and stuff like that. So the book came out in 1998 and it's called Dark Alliance, the CIA, the Contras and the crack cocaine explosion. Like I said, if you look on YouTube, um, I had to dig around a little bit to find it, but there is uh, footage of him talking at Berkeley, like right after this book came out, like it's about an hour long uh, and he's kind of like talking about it and it's actually like pretty interesting. And then they published a revised version the following year uh, that had him talking about, because that's when all the federal investigation reports came out, and so he was, like, responding to that. Um, and it the book came out, and it won, like, a bunch of awards. So, you know what I mean. Now, what ended up happening after that is that, um, not surprisingly, Gary Webb got a little bit disillusioned. Because he's like, he had worked for newspapers his whole life. I mean, he actually started going to college for journalism. He didn't finish because he got a job as a journalist and just kind of like worked his way up in that way. But um, he said prior to him writing the Dark Alliance series, he's like, I would have defended, um, you know, the the profession, like the, uh, you know, newspaper industry, like to anybody that would listen uh, you know, and, and journalism being like a, a really noble profession and everything. But he's like, I, you know, and he's like, I had always had like an easy time. I had won prizes and stuff. And I thought it was just because I was shit hot at my job or whatever. But it turns out um, that the second you write something that people in power don't want you don't want anybody to know about, um, then they're going to fuck up your shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so he kind of uh, got a little bit of a eye opener there so uh and he actually wrote an article about this later on that was called the mighty Wurlitzer plays on like talking about uh the little piano yeah yeah it's you know he, he's like basically you write about something that they don't want you to know about and then all of a sudden like your life is not fucking worth it so after he quit the newspaper the san jose mercury news he actually went and worked as an investigator for the California State Legislature. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, like, one of his jobs was investigating, like, racial profiling. Because, uh, you know, at the time, like, doing, like, traffic stops and stuff like that. It was like, uh, so he talked a lot about racial profiling and that. And, you know, various other kind of things. And he also did, um, you know, freelance investigatives. Like, he worked for Esquire and stuff like that. Um, and then he went and worked at the state assembly's office of majority services and got laid off when a new assembly member came in. And in August of 2004, uh, he actually ended up working for the Sacramento News and Review, which is like an alternative paper, like a weekly paper, and uh, did investigative writing. One of the last things that he wrote uh, before he died was um, it was kind of about how some video games were... Um, were used to kind of like encourage people to like be like recruit them into the military you know what i mean yeah like yeah <laughs> so he uh yeah so he wrote an article about that and that was one of the last major things that he wrote before he died now now here's the thing so gary webb was found dead in his house in december of 2004 he had two gunshot wounds in his head now Sacramento, Sacramento County Coroner's Office ruled his death a suicide, even though it's two shots, which is weird. That's pretty weird. And it was with a thirty-eight. How do you feel about that? No, not good. Where were the, where were the hits? Um, the first shot uh, was, it looked like he had put the gun to his right ear, and the first shot went through his face, and then the second one went through an artery. Like, the first shot came out his left cheek. Like, it was right here. So and he came could out have survived left. it. Right. Here's the thing. But then, I like, to, to have the it. wherewithal to, like, shoot again? Yeah, here, here, here's the thing. 
I know all about 38 Special, man. Fucking, I've had 37 Magnum revolvers and hand loaded uh, a lot of 38 Special and 357 loads for it. Had a uh, Smith and Wesson 586, six inch barrel fucking target revolver. One of the sweetest fucking revolvers ever. I'm very familiar with 38 Special. It's not a very energetic load. Maybe a little bit less than nine millimeter. I don't know exactly what projectile he was using or what load. Still, you would think if you were to put that up to your ear and pull a trigger and it didn't kill you because the path of the bullet just wasn't in a real critical spot, you'd think it would at least knock you out. See, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I was and like, look, it, they yeah. said, according to the coroner's report, it said that the gun was behind his right ear Yeah. and that the first bullet exited his left cheek so it went through his face yeah and then the second one hit an artery i was sitting there thinking it's possible for you to shoot yourself twice in the head but shooting yourself in the neck and in, in it going through your face would you really have the ball like to do it again unless you did it real quick i don't know man that just sounds kind of weird to me well the face is not a uh, critical area well, I know that, just bone and but shit. you would think that, I mean, just like the shock of that happening. You would think that what would happen is, is that if you did that, it would fucking, first of all, just knock you on your ass. It would knock you out. That's what I was thinking. Right. And you'd lay there. Probably die of blood loss, but I guess not in this case, if, if, if he survived that. And then you come to a few minutes later and fucking the, the pistol's laying over on the ground and then you crawl over there and get it and then take a better shot. Shooting yourself in the head involves getting into the cranial cavity, into the brain, all right? And dudes have survived that, having a bullet tunnel right through their brain. Yep. Okay? It's not a Which sure I'm thing. I'm sure it's not fun. All right. Not a sure thing. I mean, it's most likely it kills you, but uh, you... But it might not. Yeah. Which is fucking horrifying. That's horrifying. Um... Well, that's why some people do things like jump off a high, you know, building. So, man, that that fall on the way down. Oh, no thanks. I don't want to tell people, you know, yeah. the best way to do yes. it. You probably get fucking demonetized anyway. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Something we, I'm like sure a, we've already been demonetized. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like a pistol. There's not a lot of energy there, especially a 38. Anything, you know, 38 and smaller. There's not a lot of energy there. I wouldn't do it. You want something bigger. And the placement's got to be correct. Some people say, well, what about poison? No, po that's not a good death, man. You get real fucking sick. Yeah, no thanks. Um, there are many pleasant drugs out there, alcohol being one of them. Is this, you, can, you can do it that way. Yeah, there's there's yeah. weird ways of doing that. Um, if you know how to run IVs and things, you know, so something kind of like lethal injection, you know. There's a bunch of different ways that are more pleasant than that. And Jenny and I were talking about some people that fucking ended themselves. I, cause I heard that even the word that started with S about ending yourself is fucking, I don't know, that you can get monetized, demonetized. Well, they, that. yeah, you can. Um, so I, I don't know. Um, the people that do that think that they're a burden to other people. And they're going to try to uh, get rid of themselves, and it'll be better for everybody else around them. No, it gets worse for them that you're gone. One dude climbed inside a sleeping bag, shot himself to keep the mess down. But still, his family had to find him like that. And then fucking, you know what I mean? And, and then, you know, he's not around to help pay bills and shit. And then they got to spend money on fucking disposing of him. And, no, it's not the way to do it. Pull your own weight, man. Fight back fucking a lot of times people do that shit over problems that are easily solved and had they just waited it would have fucking worked itself out anyway <laughs> you know don't do it it's not worth it yeah well i mean it's easy to say that but yeah. it's like you know some people now, don't think that right. i'd have to i'd have to see what this crime scene looked like or if it, if it was a crime scene okay a lot of times if an intelligence agency is going to do this, it's four or five guys who see, probably maybe know the guy or there's some kind of connection or they talk their way in. They could be dressed as police. And they grab him, one on each limb, and they do something to him to, to make it look like he did it to himself. 
That's how you do it. That includes throwing somebody out of windows. They do that too. But it usually involves ropes. Easy. Four or five guys. I kind of feel like throwing somebody out a window or off a cliff would probably be the better proposition. Back in the twenties and the thirties, throwing somebody out off of something was the way to do it. But back, but back then there weren't very many security cameras. That's true. So you had you have to get the team to the target. You got to be sneaky. You have to get the team to the target. If you find somebody who's been at the end of swinging from the end of a rope in a wooded area, no. No, that's a fucking intelligence agency that did that, or an, organ, an organization, because they had to do it in the wooded area. No cameras, see? But a person who's going to do that themselves usually doesn't care about the cameras. So they do it in the luxury of their own little apartment, you know, in the privacy of their own apartment. So it, it, it's very situational. Part of the thing of intelligence agencies is that, is that they all have law enforcement training. And they all understand about how indictments happen. And they understand police investigative techniques. So the mission always is in a, performed in a way that foils investigation. You know. Outside is the best. That helps. There's just less to work with. So what happened with this guy? I give it 50-50. Maybe he did do that to himself. Well, okay. So let me say, I'm I'm not really sure where I come down on this because, one, I thought it was pretty weird that it's like most people don't usually like shoot themselves in the head twice. It's not impossible. Um, it, you know, yeah, it has it's been unlikely. done before. It's, it's un- unlikely. Yeah. However, I will note that um, Gary Webb's family, including his ex-wife, because, oh, by the way, like, all the shit that happened, like, the whole shit storm that happened, like, after the series came out and him getting fired and all that, uh, that, you know, caused his marriage to break up and stuff like that as well, because he was married and he had, like, three kids. Um, his ex-wife said that she did not believe he had been murdered. She thought that he had killed himself because, um... Well, he hadn't really been able to get another job at a paper. His career wasn't ruined, ruined, but I mean, because he was still doing investigative reporting, but not to the extent that he had been before. Like he was just working for smaller outfits. And so I think he was depressed about that. And also he wasn't making that much money and he couldn't. What I heard from sources, you know, various sources around the Internet was that he could not afford to pay his mortgage on his house anymore. So he had to sell his house. And he actually ended up shooting himself on the day he was supposed to move out of the house. Okay. So, yeah, the situation... Now now that I know that, the situation does kind of lean towards... Yeah, maybe yeah maybe. But, and his ex-wife said, um, you know, Susan Bell, her name is, and she did say that he'd been depressed for a long time, which, like I said, you know, the poor fucking guy, you can't... You know, it's very understandable um, because... You know, he wrote this article and he was just trying to get information out there that he thought was interesting and that people needed to know. And it basically kind of ruined his life. I mean, you know, which that's how it happens sometimes. So it's entirely possible. So do I think that he was murdered? I don't know. It's possible. Um, And a lot of people do still believe that. Um, Because I saw like some other, uh, you know, articles and like blog posts and stuff like that where some people thought that that yeah, like maybe the CIA allegedly um, did kind of like do that and like make it look like he had killed himself. I don't know though. I mean, they do some shady shit, uh, you know, that's for sure. But I don't know. It, and the thing about it is that it had been at the point that he died, it had been eight years since the original series. Um, you know, and six years I think since his book had come out right yeah sort of like six years since his book had come out so you'd think that if they were going to do it they wouldn't have waited that long I don't know but and and I'm not saying that I don't think that like the CIA was doing what he said that they were doing because I absolutely think they were and as I said I think they did come out later and they didn't say yeah we did that shit they did kind of say though that well some of the allegations he made were true Another they th- did know about that shit, and they did, like, protect a lot of the and th- drug dealers. And another stuff. thing about the two shots to the head thing, in light of everything else, now that I think about it, 
if a pro team went in there to liquidate that dude, they would have only done it in one shot. They, the, the, the placement would have been perfect. You got guys holding him down and everything? Yeah, you'd think why would they want why would they yeah. want to introduce uncertainty? Right. They would by, know right where to place Because it. the coroner's office yeah. said that they got a fuck ton of phone calls when people yeah. like because people thought he'd been murdered. Right. You know what I mean? Because they're like, what the fuck? What's up with two shots? You know what I mean? They said they got yeah. a whole fuck ton. So people were suspicious. Nah. A pro team goes in there and fucking talks to you. They, like, they might think that they're cops or somebody you know. You might know them. And then, boom, they grab you by the... There's four or five guys there. They grab you by the wrist and the fucking ankles. Stretch your ass out. You just can't fight that too, that many guys, you know. Uh, unless you're fucking supernaturally big. And then they just fucking hold him down and just fucking put it right where it has to go and fucking... They're going to make sure that the angles are correct to, how, to, to kind of fit a situation where it's, you know, they might put him in a chair too, you know what I mean, to make it look like he did it in a chair. And then um, they're going to do it like that. And then they're going to have friendly people in the DA's office probably too to say, oh, yeah, that was suicide, you know. But maybe not, because if it looks good enough, the police on, on their own will decide that, yeah, that was a suicide, you know. No signs of forced entry. Doors were locked. That kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, so basically, after he died, um, you know, there was kind of in two thousand six, uh, there was a biography of him that was written. Um, that uh, was written by a journalist named Nick Shu, and that was the book. That book and Dark Alliance. Those two books were what um, the movie Kill the Messenger was based on, which came out in two thousand fourteen with Jeremy Renner if you haven't seen it. Uh it's about Gary Webb. They it's it's uh, they took some liberties, but I think it's like um pretty fairly accurate. So, um basically the guy that wrote the biography said that mainly uh a lot of the stuff that Gary Webb first reported in the Dark Alliance series um about the CIA involvement um then that they had actually later ag acknowledged that they had covered up uh, contra drug trafficking. Like I said, I don't know if they were directly, directly involved, but they for sure knew about it and were allowing it to happen and were protecting kind of the main players for their own uh, reasons. So they did come out and admit that much, but even people sympathetic to Gary Webb are basically saying that the original series maybe was a little overblown because he did kind of make much of the fact that, this drug ring that he was talking about, which was free Rick Ross and, uh, you know, Blandon and, uh, Menezes, which I say wrong every time, um, that they were the ones that caused the whole crack explosion. He's like, maybe it was a little more complicated than that. Um, and that seems to be like one point of contention that people bring that maybe that was like exaggerated that maybe he like oversimplified like the whole start of the, you know, crack epidemic or whatever, and just kind of boiled it down to like this main drug ring when it really, it was like a lot more complex than that maybe. And he didn't outright make this statement, but I think that a lot, particularly in South central and uh, in the black community, a lot of people do believe there that the CIA were purposefully, like I said, flooding the streets with, uh, crack, which I don't think is the case. They were just selling crack, and that's where it was ending up. Right, and that's where yeah. there was a, yeah, and like I said, they didn't particularly care about, like, the repercussions of what they were yeah. doing. They just needed the money to, you know, fund their, their shit. Uh, and they didn't really give a shit about all of the fallout from it. So, you know, which is bad enough, for Christ's sake. Uh, but... Uh, it, like I said, I don't really blame people for thinking the CIA was doing that deliberately because that does sound like some shit they would do. But um, I don't necessarily think they were doing it went it to where the case. demand It went, went to where the demand right. was. Mm -hmm. And to the clientele that could afford it. You know what I mean? Like in, during that time, upper income people would, weren't smoking crack. They were snorting coke. Yeah, because they could afford right. the good stuff. Lower income is going to go in that, in that day and age and been fucking, you know, fucking the black neighborhoods in L.A., yeah. 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 I mean, they, they found, you know, a, an open market pretty much. Yeah. And they made a lot of money. It's a perfect, it's the perfect illegal drug to make money off of because it doesn't last very long and it's cheap, cheap buy in and it's repeated. Buy and like I said, and it's and super it's addictive. addictive. Right. It's super addictive. So, you know, yeah. you pay 10, $20 for yeah. one rock and then yeah. it's like awesome, but then it wears off like yeah. really, really quickly, yeah. and you need another one. And it's an amphetamine for some reason. You know, it's something that's an upper, 
And for some reason, the African American community likes those. They never psychedelics never caught on with them. White people like psychedelics. They'll buy acid and shit, fucking mescaline and peyote. But uh, black people don't like those for some reason. I don't know if it's cultural or if it's biological. It could be. They just, but they they're gonna go for some kind of an amphetamine. Uh, I don't I don't think it was intended. Based on what you're saying, probably not. It's just that they knew that that was addictive. And that if you got it inside the United States, and it didn't last long, so it was it didn't last long. It was addictive, and it was cheap buy-in. If you got it inside the borders of the United States, you make a lot of money. And they did. They did. Yeah. They were right. Make a lot of you know fucking black funding, untraceable money. That's yeah. what they needed. Yeah. And, and that's uh, what, like I said, that's what people were yeah. mad about because they were using it to fund the Contras. Well, yeah. among other things, they funded other right. things too. But so it like, rolled. In, it rolled into. Lower income African American neighborhoods, and that's where it did its job. I don't think they intended it, but that's where it went. And it kind of, like I said, yeah. it kind of uh, fucked up a whole lot of stuff yeah. there, and like that whole. Then community. the media focused in on it, which really tainted its reputation, and it became a black drug, known as a black drug. White people wouldn't touch it. They take LSD, they'd snort cocaine, but they wouldn't take, they wouldn't snort, snort crack. I remember, or wouldn't smoke crack. I remember, some people did. People that liked cocaine and couldn't afford cocaine would do it, but it just didn't take off in the in the white market. Not as much. No, not as much as say LSD and weed and. I kind of feel like know. the big thing nowadays is like meth in rural America. That's kind of like the big yeah. thing. Yeah, well, that's, that's, meth and oxy, like all the yeah, that, that's, prescription drugs. That's biker crack. Biker crack. Yeah, yeah. you it lasts a lot longer. Fuck True. your teeth up though. I have absolutely teeth. never had the desire to try yeah. meth. I can't stand amphetamines. I just, I just don't like them. I don't, I don't think that I would yeah. be too into that. To be I honest. like hallucinogens. Yeah, those Things are fun. That halluc- make you hallucinate like fucking. Drinking LSD. is fun. Yeah, hallucinogens are fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do not need to be any more nervous or amped up uh-uh. or anything like that than I already am. I would be a fucking rage monster mm-hmm. at all times. That would just not be a good time for anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I need I need shit that like will make me chill out and relax because I can't. So I don't I don't need anything that's gonna like make me all fucking spazzy all the time. Jesus Christ. But yeah, so uh so yeah, as I mentioned, uh Kill the Messenger is the movie, two thousand fourteen. Also um, there is a TV series, which I've heard of, but I've never seen, and it's called Snowfall, and, um, it's set in LA in 1983, and it's kind of about this. It's like a, well, it's about the first, it's not about Gary Webb specifically, because it's set, like, much earlier than the article came out, but it's kind of about the early days of, like, the crack epidemic, and it does kind of go into that narrative um, where it has like a CIA operative yeah. character and stuff like that, so they so they are acknowledging that they knew that all that shit. Ben Frail must have missed the show. So, he's going, so the CIA did what? They were selling crack to do it? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, so the CIA was swapping guns for crack on the streets of LA, but no. they weren't the only ones. No, that's not what it was. The CIA was selling, well, not the CIA. The CIA funded crack sales inside the United States so they could get black funding to buy weapons and Stinger missiles. And shit like that, and give them to the, well, to, the actually, Contras. to the Contras. Yeah, yeah, they said all that shit. Like, yeah, yeah. Ben said I came in late. Sorry. Yeah. Ben said, weren't they swapping some of the drugs for rifles, which they were then selling or offloading in Mexico to undermine the Mexican government or something? No, no, I don't know no. about that. I mean, maybe. No. Again, that sounds Mexican, like legit. Mexican drug cartels use people here inside the United States to buy weapons, and sm- and then they put them in a pipeline to get them smuggled back into Mexico. A lot of the Mexican cartels are equipped with American civilian AR-15s or AK-47s because it, that, that's an easy way to get them. Um, they kind of banned guns in Mexico, I think, in the 70s, although they tried to open them back up for civilian purpose, pur- pur- uh, purchase, uh, mostly things like pistols, because damn sure the Mexican cops won't help you against the cartels. I've seen... I've had guys in Mexico send me videos of them setting dudes on fire in front of cops and the cops running. Okay? Because the cartels run Mexico, not the cops. Not really. Because the cartels work for the poli- work for political, powerful political people inside Mexico. Why, why would you want to worry? If you're a politician, why would you depend upon 
a justice system or or a government system to secure your power. It, it's too unwieldy. It's too weak. You have to follow rules. What's better is to be in a government, make a bunch of money on the side in, in the drug trade, and use them to hire cartel uh, fucking narco armies to attack enemy politicians and keep people in line and make more money. There's no money in the government really anymore. The money is in, in Mexico, the money is in those cartels. Because they run it. I mean, they'll take a judge and boil him alive and pour him out in front of the fucking courtroom steps, okay? Those are the kind of guys you want working for you. They'll do anything you tell them to. And they just spread horror throughout the society. Cops are afraid to arrest them because not only will they go after that cop, they'll go after that cop's family. And so, you know, it's not terrorism. It's beyond that. It's horrorism. It's like something out of fucking Friday the 13th. Worse. 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 Drugs and gun running is the real economy of the world. Uh, well, not really. To guns some guns extent. aren't worth that much. You can get it. You can get a uh, an international AK that's passed through a lot of hands. Maybe came from Central Africa at one time. Been in the fucking seventies or eighties. You can get something like that for about twenty five dollars a unit if you buy them in bulk. They're not worth that much. But. <clears throat> It's not just people selling them to make money. for the, It's governments buying those things and giving them to people to overthrow a government that they don't like. You know. But, well, the thing about it is that, sadly, even though Gary Webb is no longer with us, uh, you know, and he died a long time ago, I do kind of feel like nowadays... I, I feel like he's seen as like more of a more of a hero now than he was at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah, you know, I'm trying to like come at it from like a balanced point of view and maybe some of the claims he made were exaggerated and stuff, but I mean, he really did like go down there and investigate all this stuff and he, you know, really brought attention to an issue which wasn't really being addressed as i said the two you know ap reporters had come out with the shit in 1985 and nobody followed up on it really i mean yeah they did a couple investigations but that never came up with anything so for him to come out and for it to be like such a big thing and like put such a spotlight on it that now i kind of feel like culturally it's probably common knowledge uh that the cia at least knew what was going on with that shit and was involved in it um, so, you know, you can really thank him for that because he was kind of the one that brought attention to it again, like a story yeah. that everybody had kind of forgotten about because you have to think that by the time he wrote the story, you know, that had been, you know, that had gone on like a decade before, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but he brought new eyes onto it and it, it didn't really end well for him, but you know, I don't think they killed him though. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking maybe not. Like I said, it does give me pause. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, I was saying when you were in the bathroom, I said that it does seem strange that, I mean, if they were going to wipe him out, you'd think that they would do it, like, sooner after. Yeah. Because it had been, like, six years yeah. since the book had come out. No, like, and eight years since the series had they come would, out. They would have done it. Well, the book came out, and the damage was done, so they just said, ah, fuck him. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, you'd think that they would... Yeah. and. Really, like you said, it's probably a lot of times they I think they had successfully discredited or or, you know, introduced enough controversy and question about his ethics and stuff like that into the situation that he thought, well, maybe everybody will just think that, you know, won't really listen to him anymore and won't take him as seriously, yeah. which kind of is what ended up happening. Like I said, it didn't ruin ruin his career, but. He he wasn't like operating at the same level as he was before. Yeah. So they were pretty successful in bringing, you know, kind of putting him down to size, I guess. And it ended up fucking him over, man. Like I guess he couldn't take it, which is really sad. But yeah, this was like a really interesting case. So I'm really glad that you guys recommended it. Oh, well, are you gonna say bye? Or are you just leaving? Yeah, I just said bye. Oh. <laughs> okay. So I guess he's just going to leave because <laughs> he has to go to the bathroom. Uh, all right. So I guess we're going to wrap it up because it's getting kind of late and I have to go to bed soon because I got to get up at five in the morning again. 
for the long ass drive. Uh, so yeah. So thanks everybody for dropping by this evening. This was a fascinating topic and a fascinating discussion as always. Uh, remember to come by on, I guess we're going to do the sidetracks on Friday night. We, um, we got to go to Memento Mori on Friday night, but we don't use, we don't go to that until later. So we can probably do a live stream like before we go, like do a little, uh, pre-gaming, I guess is what we'll do. And we can hang out with you guys and talk about bullshit like we usually do on Friday night. So that should be fun. So, uh, yeah, have a good rest of your night, you guys, and have a good day tomorrow. And we will see you guys again on Friday night. Good night.